Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our open, opening evening of Modern Minds on Jewish Matters. And this is a time where, like so many weeks last year, I know many of you participated in it, uh, we come together because we're interested, we're, we're, we're thoughtful, we're sophisticated, uh, we're caring. And so we come together here at Beth Jacob to engage in conversations about matters that are important to us that are important to the Jewish community and also for the, for the world community. Uh, so we're really excited to be back here for a new series um, this year. I want to thank um, our sponsor of the series, uh, Dr. Eli Barron. And thank him so much for his generosity and vision in supporting the programming this year. Thank you, Eli. Great to see you here tonight. Okay, I'm really excited about the speaker and the topic that we have tonight in part because like so many of you, um, on the forefront of my mind is concern, deep concern for the situation for the Matzav in the state of Israel. It's a very challenging, difficult time of, of violence, of terror attacks against Jews, against Israelis in Israel. And this is really a time where we want to support one another, strengthen one another, thinking about Israel, but also I think to feel good about our friends uh, some of our friends that we have in the world. And one great friend of Israel um, is our speaker tonight, that's Randy Neal, who is the Western Regional Coordinator for Christians United for Israel, that's CUFI, um, where Randy joined the organization in 2006 at the invitation of its founder, Pastor John Hagee. And Randy, through his active support for Israel, through his creative leadership, um, supervising and coordinating, what is it, 13 states? I think you told me 13 states um, in the western part of, of the United States has really helped create Kufi to be what you might say is the largest pro-Israel organization in America, Christians United for Israel. And their friendship for the state of Israel and for the Jewish people has made a tremendous uh, difference for Israel. Um, they work hard to promote and to support a secure, a strong um, Israel, uh, which of course is so important. And this is a, something that I feel deeply, um, I'm an officer on the Israel Christian Nexus, which is based here in Los Angeles, which celebrates and works hard, like Hufai does on a national basis, on strengthening, cherishing, and strengthening that relationship between uh, the Jewish people and the Christian community for common values, common goals, facing our, our threats that we all face today um, and supporting the state of Israel, the people of, uh, of Israel. So thank you. Let's give a, a round just to uh, thank Randy. According to um, IDF Vice Commander Bensi Gruber, Randy gives important facts about Israel that even many Israelis uh, do not know. Um, Neil Randy came to QFI with years of experience educa educating Christians about the biblical mandate to support Israel, the history of Christian anti-Semitism, and political activism in the faith community. Uh, it's really an honor and a privilege to host uh, Randy tonight, and he's going to speak about why and how Christians seek to bless the Jewish state. Uh, without further ado, pleasure to introduce uh, Randy Neal. Thank you, Rabbi Top, and uh, somebody uh, relay my gratitude to Rabbi Posey when he returns as well. So it's uh, it's really a privilege and honor to be here. I've Spoken at a number of synagogues in Southern California and several across the country, and I know I, I know that I'm within uh, w among friends right now, uh, in uh, just by the folks that have come up and, and the conversations that I've had. And but it's not uncommon for people to you know wonder you know who are you, what do you want, why are you here, and so uh, <laughs> we'll so we'll address all that. You know I wasn't born in a Christian home. I, I came to faith late in life, and. Uh, I was determined not to become a Christian, by golly. I was absolutely positive I wasn't going to become a Christian because my dad warned me about the hypocrisy in those churches. But I saw some attributes in uh, some guys. Had a near-death experience. A house fire should have killed everybody in the house, and it didn't. And so I started reflecting on my mortality. And I was drawn to these guys that had a Bible study every Saturday morning. And every Saturday, they invited me to join. And as we're going through this, uh, this Bible study, we start encountering the word Israel in the Bible study. And, uh, and I said, you know, guys, and I, I didn't become a Christian at this point. This was months before I had. I said, guys, is this, 
is this like Israel like on CNN? <laughs> and that's exactly the response they gave me. At the Bible said they laughed out loud and they said, no, no, wherever you see the word Israel in the Bible, just pretend that it says the church there. And I was introduced to supersession or, re or replacement theology, basically saying that, yes, God's word is without error, but wherever he wrote Israel, you should take some white out to it and, uh, and pencil in the church there. And I didn't hook my wagon to that, or I probably wouldn't be up here right now. And uh, I, didn't, I, I just couldn't wrap my brain and reconcile how could the word of God be without error, and he's not saying what he really means. And so I, I followed a different thread, and I believe, like millions of Christians around the world believe, that, uh, that if you believe in the Word of God, if you call yourself a Christian, if you call yourself an observant Jew, you can't do any of those things. You can't call yourself an observant Jew. You can't call yourself a Christian if you don't love what God loves. And God loves Israel and God loves the Jewish people, according to my Bible. And so that's the conviction that we start with. And from, our, from the first page to the last, that's the mandate that we challenge uh, our, our folks with. We don't go, preach to the choir. We don't hold an event and people that are like-minded come. We go and try to find people that are on the fence and are curious and bewildered why uh, Christians are so passionate about Israel. And, and some of them have some screwy, you know, notions. Some of them are wrapped up. Some of them think, you know, that, that we're supposed to herd them all, all you, the Jews to Israel like cattle, and then Jesus will come back. I don't know anybody in the leadership or membership that subscribes to that, but there's some pretty, you know, wacky uh, folks out there that do. Uh, but one of the things that uh, I just want to kind of give you a disclaimer, this is not going to be an infomercial for CFI, but I have to, it's, it's a phenomenon and it's pretty much the vehicle in which I dwell in this endeavor. And so we are going to cover a lot of, of ground and some of the facets of it. What distinguishes our organization from all the other pro-Israel organizations, essentially, and there are many of them, and they're noble, and they do great things, so with food closets, or helping for all or just or countless things that they do. And just bringing groups of, you know, from churches to Israel to, uh, to just thrust you know, lifeblood into the tourist economy is, a, is an amaz amazing gesture of solidarity. But one of the things that distinguishes us, and it, may, and it lost us a lot of friends when it was announced, is that we are by design and without exception non-conversionary to the Jewish people. Our events that we host are informational, educational, and intended to be solidarity events. And so before, you know, before I get all the way through my message tonight, I'm going to circle back around and explain to you why that is and just some of the, I'm going to tell you some of the stories behind the birth of this organization and, uh, and just some things you're not going to find on our website or any, any of the books that any of our leaders wrote, including Pastor Hagee. But it starts out with this biblical mandate, and we'll go into a church and one of the cornerstone passages that we cite is Genesis 12, 3. I'll bless as a blessing, I'll curse thee that curse thee, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And we can do a six-week sermon series on the three lines in that Bible. That, you know, it's, it's a mind-boggling, uh, upside-down math equation that the Jewish people, your community, you don't even make up one-third of one percent of the world population as a people group. But year in after year out, 25, 30, 35 percent of the Nobel Prizes you know, ultimately go to, to Jewish recipients because of this conviction to leave the world a better place than you inherited it. And, and cutting edge things that extend the days of life and enhance the quality of life with agriculture, medicine, environment, energy, communications. And, and, so, and, and so invariably the critics will say, is that all you've got? You're cherry picking a couple of scriptures and you're trying to build a case? And we're like, yeah, yeah, we are. Yeah, we're just, we're, we're cherry picking just a couple of scriptures. Just a few. So we're going to go through all those one by one now. <laughs> so, no, we're not actually. But uh, you know, one of the, the one of the elementary ones is Genesis 12:3 because you really can make a case for that. And and I was sitting with the, the fellow next to me on the front row, and he made a comment. I had to mute him because he was starting to borrow my script a little bit. And that is, you know, you, you don't have to be a believer. You don't have to believe in God. You can if you just take a look at the facts. If you take a look at the empires, and nations and dictators that dealt harshly with the Jewish people, if they still exist today, they are a shell of what they once were. You know, you can wring your hands about what we see happening in the Middle East right now. Putin is 
setting up his camp in Syria right now. There are many, many people that have had those designs and plans, and they are in the dustbin of history right now. It's not Kufi, it's not the UN, it's not Obama, it's not the United States. It's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that's the defender of Israel, and, and we, we're going to circle back around because we have faith in him, and we're going to do whatever we can to be an instrument to and a, and a mouthpiece for that. But in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. You know, th this drip irrigation technology and hothouse technology that was being used in Gaza, handed over to the PA on a silver platter, by the way, in 2005, um, hours before they destroyed them. That same technology right now is being, is being implemented in Navajo Nation in, er in er Arizona and New Mexico. Hundreds of Navajo farmers, I'm going to go there on the 2nd of November to meet with them. They've already gone to Israel, they've already had Israeli hydrologists come to the Navajo Nation and meet with the Navajo president. And they are excited for the first time they're going to be able to grow using Israeli drip irrigation technology. They're going to be able to grow something more than creosote and tumbleweeds. They, they're, they're not just thinking about feeding their family, they're thinking about making an income and having farmers markets and farm to fork uh, restaurants. That, it, uh, it's exciting. If you take a look at just uh, the march before last, first thing Jerry Brown, Governor Brown wanted to do when Netanyahu visited was tell us about your water you know, your water technology, your water reclamation, your water recycling, your water conservation. And the result of that is just a few hours from here. It's the IDE desalinization plant, the largest desalinization plant in, the, in North America. It's Israeli technology, it's an Israeli company doing the installation. And in just a matter of weeks, San Diego is about to get 54 million gallons of water every day in the worst drought in our recorded history. And, it, and I, I, I'm not going to go and expand the 90-minute presentation that I do with Christians that are just beginning to have their epiphany about God's plan for Israel, but I'm just giving you a cursory overview of some of the things that we show them to kind of whet their appetite. And again, I'm not, we're not preaching to the choir. These are people that this is entirely a foreign paradigm. We take a look at this passage that they and you probably have read more times than you can recall, but most people don't realize that the first couple sentences in it is inside out, it's reversed, it's upside down. You don't give birth before you go into labor. But that's exactly what Isaiah 66 said happens with the nation of Israel, that before she was in labor, she gave birth, and before her pain came, she delivered a male child. And there are millions of American Christians that believe that that's exactly what happened on May 14, 1948, that, uh, that, that the nation was born in a day. We've got a lot of a lot of Christians that we deal with that are not friendly, that believe that exactly what I joked about in my Bible study, they believe that the church is the new Israel. They believe that, that when your predecessors didn't embrace Jesus as the Messiah, that God in his foreknowledge and sovereignty, he didn't see that coming at all. And he had to step back and grab a handrail and, make, and come up with a plan B. And I, I don't think that that's anywhere near the case at all. And you can't have it both ways. You can't say that his word is without error and then say, well, he did, really didn't mean this. We made a promise and he made an amendment to it. He, he changed his mind. If you take a look at it, I make them all read out loud. How, you know, how long is, is his promise? Lift up your eyes from where you are. Look north and south and east and west and all the land that you see I'll give to you and your descendants. And I have them all say out loud together forever because that's how long we believe that that land's been entrusted. Ezekiel 36 means that the promises that, that he made, he's going to keep them regardless of whether the Jewish people are, you know, that's not out of obedience or earning it or worthy. It's because he said he's going to do it. And that's what we believe he's doing. It's because he's a God that keeps his promises. And you may recall that just a couple of years ago when Benjamin Netanyahu closed his address to the United Nations, he wrapped up his address quoting Amos 9, that I'll firmly plant them there in their own land, and they will never again be uprooted from the land I've given them, says the Lord your God. And that's, that is just a cursory overview of, the, of what we build as a biblical foundation. And as believers, they start to connect the dots, and they start to realize that, that the Jewish roots of the Christian faith, the Jewishness of, of Jesus, and we finally bring them to a point where they start looking, if they are so serious about their faith, then they embark on a very painful history of looking at the chapters of 1,700 years of the most horrific, unspeakable acts that one man can commit to another under the banner of Christendom to the Jewish people. And they can't believe what they're reading. 
they can't believe that it happened. And then they'll finally say, time out, Randy. You know, you know and I know that the people that did those things didn't have the hurt or mind of Jesus. And so that's not Christian history, so stop talking about that. And I say very respectfully, go tell that to the Jewish community because we are the successors of that legacy. And if we don't commit to change the trend, history will repeat itself. And so that is where we bring them. And so that's just, that is a very rough thumbnail sketch backdrop. So let me tell you about how this organization was born. Nearly four decades ago, a man by the name of John Hagee uh, told his wife Diana, don't ask me to go to Israel, we're not going to go to Israel. I don't, need, I don't need to walk where, you know, the people in the Bible walk to know that they walk there. My faith is strong enough, I don't need to go and validate it. And he said, don't, you know, don't even ask, we're not going to go. In, in the wake of the 1973 Yom Kippur War, there was a doc Christian documentary that was made, and it was called Apples of Gold. And it showed how, you know, in the wake of the 67 war, Israel was kind of resting on her laurels a little bit. She kind of had her chest puffed out, or she was feeling a little invincible, and on the holiest day of her calendar, she was attacked shamelessly and relentlessly. And they were kind of, you know, they really were staggering. And literally, like the Calgary in the foxhole, counting their rounds of ammunition, and it was running out. Gold in my ear called Richard Nixon. I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to connect the dot. Gold in my ear ca calls Richard Nixon. He remembers the words of his dying mother, if you can ever help the Jews do it. Against the counsel of you know, all of his advisors, he goes ahead and he has the cutting edge military hardware airlifted Israel. Why commandos are brought to our Southwest to learn how to implement it and use it. And as the credits were flickering to a close on that documentary, he leaned over to Diana and he said, we're going to go to Israel. And he tells the story that he went to Israel as a tourist and he came back as a Zionist. And it happened when he was at the Western Wall. He felt something very powerful strike him and he felt that he almost could audibly hear the Lord tell him, I want you to bless my people. And he goes, what? He goes, I want you to unite Christians. So he went back home and he mustered around and, and he took $100,000 of his own money for a three-day conference for what I would easily be able to argue were the most influential generals in Christendom in this nation. They weren't guys that had a popular Christian TV program. They were the guy that owned the broadcasting company. They weren't the guy that had a popular book. It was the guy that owned the publishing company. These were generals that they had armies. If they wanted to take a hill, they had the bandwidth to be able to do it. He brings them out on, on, his, on his own dime for a three-day conference to cast the vision of this would-be organization, this vehicle for Christians that love the Jewish people in the state of Israel to be able to work corporately together. And he warned his family and staff that when we get to that part about it being non-conversionary, just pretend that we threw a hornet's nest into the room because people are gonna scream, people are gonna walk out, people are gonna pound their fists, and we're gonna be up till two o'clock in the morning. And so he got to that part 11.30 in, uh, for the lunch break, right before the lunch break, he says this, this organization is going to be by design, without exception, non-conversionary to the Jewish people. These events are not church services. There will be no altar call at them. We're going to just show unconditional love and we're going to educate the Christian community about the horrific past so that we can change the trends, so that we can reshape the future. And let the Jewish community dare to begin to hope that they do have a genuine friend in the Christian community after all. They break for lunch, 29 of the 30 go out to the foyer, they call their secretary, get me an earlier flight home, I want nothing to do with this organization. Fast forward to the fall of 2005, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad is asking the world to imagine itself without Zionism, remember the last two words of that quote, and America. Imagine, your, imagine a world without Zionism and America. In, kind of in the unsettling, you know, news that that's being embraced by the international community when it's spoken from the UN stage that uh, the parliament, Israel's Knesset, invites Pastor Hagee to come and speak at their Knesset. When he's done, one of the members comes up and grabs him by the sleeve and says, I've got a question for you. He says, you know when the rockets are flying in from Gaza, when the vests are exploding in pizza parlors and on buses, Jewish groups will cancel their trips out of fear, and Christian groups will book trips spontaneously to come over and show us support. They fill the buses, they fill the restaurants, 
They fill the tr tourist shops. They fill the hotels. They're the life blood of our tourist economy, but the Christians in one bus have no idea who the Christians in the bus behind them are. The Christians at one table in the restaurant don't even know the Christians at the table right next to them. It says, could you imagine the impact that you Christians could have on U.S.-Israel relations if you would just unite? And he remembered back a couple decades to those 29 guys that blew his 100 grand. And he said, Mr. Netanyahu, God himself can't unite the Christian community. <laughs> But he thought about the challenge on the long flight home. And when he got back, he called some friends, some names that you'd recognize if I dropped them. And they said, yes, it's time to do it again. And this time he invited 400 Christian leaders to come to San Antonio again on their own dime this time and warned his family and staff again, just when we get to the non-conversionary dynamic, just expect everything to break loose. Got to the non-conversionary dynamic and could have heard a pin drop. How many people agree this is time to do this? How many of you will meet us in five months, in July of 2006, in Washington, D.C., to send a message to our elected officials that it's not just their Jewish constituents that support strong U.S.-Israel relations? All 400 hands went up. And that was in 2006, and today uh, we we're on the cusp of breaking 2.5 million members. We're the largest pro-Israel organization in the country. <laughs> Here's a short overview video of our growth and what we've done. It'll be a lot easier for you to see it than for me to say it. We are Christians United for Israel. Christians United for Israel began in February 2006 with 400 evangelical leaders in San Antonio. Today, we are the largest pro-Israel organization in America. Christians United for Israel, known as KUFI, brought a group of 50 pastors and Christian leaders from every state in the nation and the District of Columbia to Israel. Thank you. Thank you for this. Thank you for standing with us. Thank you for coming. That's what they say everywhere. It's just amazing. To come and simply tell to the people of Israel, we support you, we understand you. There are still people in America who can distinguish morally between Israel and Hamas, and there are still people in America who appreciate what Israel's doing, not just to protect their own citizens, but we believe deeply when Israel battles Hamas, they're also protecting us in America. We're praying for the safety of the Palestinian people, the regular citizens, but we are praying that this nation will be wise enough to defend herself. Palestinians are like the Native Americans, you know, before they were crushed. And that is a Here's war crime. Here's the point. The people, the terrorists in that area, they continue to represent those people. They continue to get attacked since on those people in that area because they keep attacking them. Kufai has been such a blessing in every other aspect of my life. I really felt like God kept bringing it into my life and laying it on my heart. I'm a college student. I can't give all of my resources, but I can give my voice. I can give my hands and I can give my feet to do the will and the purpose that I'm called to do. I applaud Pastor Hagee for this great initiative of creating this new organization, Christian United for Israel. To have this kind of support within the Christian community is of incalculable value. This is a fight between what is right and what is wrong and God's people have made our choice. We will stand with Israel. I know the support that Israel has in your congregations. I know what you do in Washington and what you're doing there is very important. We are in a global conflict with a force which wants to destroy us. I'm here to thank you for making me feel that I am not alone. To my fellow Jews, these are our best friends in the world. As Christians United for Israel, we're spreading the truth. We're four and a half years old and we have grown to be the largest pro-Israel organization in the world. I come to you as your brother Joseph, brother in the things that are most important.
We have an historic alliance with the United States. As Pastor Hagee said, Ani Yisraeli, I am an Israeli, I say, Kulanu Yisraeli. We are all Israelis. God is reminding us of our past to remind us of our future. Israel, historically, is the land of the Jews. Well, we live in interesting times, we live in challenging times, uh, and you being in Washington makes a difference. Just like Israel, our students are strong. Our students are of good courage, and we are not afraid. We fight back because it is incumbent upon us to reform and reshape the conversation about Israel on our college campuses. God's word doesn't change. It is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We stand with Israel. When God created this earth, he chose his people. And he said, those of us who will bless them, he will bless. And those who curse them, he will curse. Both the United States and Israel, I think, share powerful cultural similarities and overlapping values, not to mention incredibly overlapping interests. Pastor Hagee, together with his beloved wife, Diana, his Ashes Chayil, his woman of valor, has demonstrated time and again his unswerving loyalty, sacrifice, and devotion to the Jewish people and to the people of Israel. As I look around the audience today, I understand why America is the greatest nation ever assembled on the face of God's green earth. Christians and Jews are spiritual brothers. Our roots are Jewish. If a line has to be drawn, draw that line around Christians and Jews because we are united and we are one in the Spirit of God. You got just a just a fraction of a second of a glimpse of some of the caliber of our of our college students, and I'm not going to you know slander any other faith groups. But the reality is, is that the Muslim Student Association came to the U.S. in 1964, and one of the things that they did after they were appalled by the decadence that they saw was they founded the Muslim Student Association, also known as the Muslim Student Union. Today, since after 1964, they've got not quite 200 chapters on campuses across this country and a presence on several more. We founded CUFI on campus in 2008, and we have 135 chapters on campuses across this country, we're, and we're running to keep up with it. And, every, and our students are up for the fight, they're up for the challenge. They're not out to mute the critics of Israel, they're out to make sure that Israel has a level playing field and that the Jewish students know that they're not alone. And so, that's, to me, that's the front line. I was at UC Irvine in 2010 when Ambassador Orrin was shouted down by those 11, and I appointed myself as the godfather of our college you know, initiative at that time. And, and uh, it's, uh, I, I say that not to impress you, I say that to encourage you, that we realize that the blood libel charges that are being slung all over the place is, uh, is just that, and we're doing what we can to illuminate it. We're in an hour, we're evil's being called good and dark is being called light and we are doing our best to try to level that playing field. But uh, 
you know, when I got into, I, I, I was doing this work before CUFI was even founded, and I think, I know that he had a presence here, he, you know, he's in D.C. now, but he, he left recently, but how many of you are familiar with Elliot Brandt from APAC? Okay, well, Elliot is a precious friend of mine, and uh, this, I, my heart is broken because after his parents had passed away, and uh, even after they passed away, they, they hung onto the house so that we could have one last Thanksgiving in it, like we have done every year for years uh, together. And this will be the first Thanksgiving that we that we're all, not all together as a family. And, and after the dinner, we would all play Balderdash, the Jews against the Christians. <laughs> and uh, Balderdash is a game where if you want to win, you have to be really good at lying. By the way, and so you know we would set Jewish-Christian relations back several hours by the end of the evening. So, but uh, but it was you know the last Sunday, uh, I, I we give away an award every year at our at our nighttime original in Sacramento, and it's called the Ruth Brandt, that uh, Elliot's mom, the Ruth Brandt Guardian of Israel Award, because if you knew his mom, and if you knew Elliot, you're compelled. No matter how effective you think you are at being a Zionist or an Israel advocate, you're you're challenged to do more and to do it better. And so, just last weekend. I don't say, again, I'm not saying that like I'm showing you home movies and trying to put you in a coma. I'm saying that because I want well, you to know that there's a kinship connection here. And, uh, and if Ruth Brandt had lived to see that video, she would have seen many of the things that she had urged us to try to do, to reach out to the African-American community and the Hispanic community and the college students and the high school students and, and, and really try to get ahead of the curve. So I, what I'm trying to tell you is that one of our biggest challenges, and it's growing in the Christian community, is complacency and indifference. Uh, it's, there's a license for it that's forged out of faith. Why do I have to do anything? Why, God doesn't need my help. You know, He's in control. I pray for the peace of Jerusalem, just like it says in Psalm 122. You know, He's got it covered. And these individuals seldom even know the name of their congressional representative, and often they're not even registered to vote. And so our challenge is to instill in them a duty to not just know the name of their elected official, but to foster relationship. And over the course of weeks and months, it's working. And uh, those 400 people that we started with that had that epiphany, it's growing in leaps and bounds. And we're, in the last 90 days, we've grown by 210,000 members. And there are people that are looking, they're looking back and forth, and they're, and they're not wanting to do an event and check the box off and know that they'll do it again next year. They want to know what they can do tomorrow. They want to do, know what they can do today. And, uh, and in the recent things that have unfolded in the last year, where news on Mondays, not news on Tuesday, uh, we have, you know, we've really reshaped our culture, the way that we look at the duties and responsibilities of the Christian community. Uh, one of those was last summer, in the wake of Operation Protect, or, uh, Protective Edge, when the, when you know, Israel all of a sudden realized that there were missile silos. These were not just shoulder launch, these weren't tripod launch, these were missile silos that could shoot missiles anywhere in Israel. And they had to go in and, and do what was necessary to take them out. And at the same time, Hamas is do, doing tunnels. And they were discovered by accident that, that they were looking to do them on Yom Kippur and have a, an Israeli 9-11, basically. And, and Israel discovered them and was able to, to thwart that. And the, all while this is happening, Israel's being demonized, uh, you know, in the media. And so we did what I, the first thing that we did was we took out full page ads in 22 of the major newspapers, just quoting the Hamas charter uh, and letting the, the American public read exactly what it is. We brought 50 pastors, one from every state and another one from the D District of Columbia in the throes of, that, of the war. When we, when we left New Jersey, Hamas signed a 72-hour ceasefire, and uh, it kicked in when we landed in Tel Aviv. We were only there for three days. I got a call on, on Wednesday and said, we're going to go, we're leaving on Monday for Israel, and uh, we need you to get 13 pastors that want to go in the wake of this war. And, uh, you know, most all of them, the second that they heard it, even if they had uh, obligations, they cleared their calendar and they said, count me in, absolutely. And it, we believe that it was God's fingerprints that, that of all the ceasefires that Hamas broke, the only one that they kept was the one that started when we landed and, the, and when we took off. And, uh, and we, you know, we brought, you know, one of the things that they all said was, you know, now I don't care. I'm not worried. You know, I'm, it's not me, but, but 
but, but, but my wife is going to ask, are we going to go to Gaza? And uh, I said, no, we're not, not going to go to Gaza. We're going to go, you know, we're just going to go to Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. And as soon as we landed, we go, hey, change your plans. We're going to go down by Gaza. And uh, so we brought him down to Sterot, uh, affectionately called Rocket Town. And uh, by that time, everybody had, no, oh, this is not cooperating. By that time, everybody had installed the red alert on their on their on their phone, the red alert app. And you know, we pull into Starot, they turn off the engine, and all of our iPhones went off with the red alert. And it was a false alarm. But it was, but just for that fraction of a second, we didn't know it was a false alarm. And it gave them just a tiny little taste of what these people live with every moment of every day. And it was it was invaluable. It, it was. You couldn't choreograph or buy the impact that that just that that realization that you know that there's a missile that was launched two miles from here, and then within a couple of minutes we realized that it was a false alarm. Again, I'm not trying to any of these things I'm citing. I'm not trying to impress you. I'm not. Uh, I, I'm. I'm. I know who I'm speaking with. I'm trying to send you a message that there's. You, you've got millions of agents in the Goyam underground that are just doing what they can to, uh, to be your friend. But we dispatched, we did a special action alert encouraging all of our members and leaders to, to do Red Alert Sunday. And so, and again, I'm gonna start crying because I, I have, this is not a normal presentation. I, have, I, I put this together for you folks and, I, and I'm revisiting these things that are pretty, uh, personal to me. <sighs> so we had churches all across the country that warned their congregation, I'm going to put my iPhone up by the microphone on the pulpit, and if that alarm goes off, we're going to leave the church just like we're evacuating and going to go into a bomb shelter. And 25 times those churches would disrupt their, you know, their service. There's another church that uh, every time it would go off, they would stop and they, they'd stop the service and they would just all pray together for the peace of Jerusalem. And one of my favorites is, because it, uh, he was one of the 51 that went to Israel with me, is uh, my Washington State director. He, he had a best-selling book. He had an, an inflow of cash like he'd never realized in his life before, and he had, a, had you know, some of it was liquid. And he said, this is what we're going to do, folks. I'm going to set this up here. And every time that alarm goes off, we're going to dedicate $1,000 to, towards bomb shelters in Starode or in, around Ashkelon. And I want you all to help match it. And that thing went off 25 times during, the, the, during his service. Well, his service was, uh, was live streamed, and a guy called in and said, hey, I want to match that. And so, uh, so when we went to Israel on that Salt Air tour, we went to this, get the grave of Max Steinberg, I believe it was, uh, a fell from this area, didn't have any family in Israel, but 150,000 people attended his funeral. And we went, we were there while, you know, the grave site was just, just fresh. And uh, we were able to award that check for fifty thousand dollars to the one of the firms that was uh, going to go ahead and make sure that it went in, into the right hands and that they'd get as many bomb shelters as possible out of that. These are just little things that we're trying to do. Um, the Iran nuclear deal. A uh, picture's worth a thousand words. If you look at the expression on Mr. Zarif's face. It, uh, it would appear that he's very pleased with the deal. We were not pleased with the deal. Everything that we did when we went to D.C. had to do with putting bigger teeth in the sanctions against Iran. And uh, we, we crossed every, every red line that we drew, and they didn't budge an inch. But what we did do is that we mobilized our Christians for the first time in our existence. Instead of asking them to come once a year to D.C., we, we mobilized them to not just attend town halls, but to create town halls for every, every congressman or senator that was not voicing opposition against that uh, Iran nuclear agreement. One, you know, we had virtually unanimous you know, support within the Republican senators except for one, and that was Jeff Flake in Arizona. And so we let him, well, he changed his mind because he found out that there was a full page ad that was going to run in the Arizona Star with 150 pastors from Arizona signing on it. And so when he found out on Friday that that was going to run on Sunday, he came out on Saturday and said, well, I'm, I'm opposing that, that. 
That's just a map. Uh, that's just uh, it's 112 town hall meetings that we did just in the month of August to try to send the message. 80% of the American public were against that deal. And uh, the two things that lay in front of us as an organization, and it's not warm and fuzzy, I'm not, I'm not proud of it, but the reality is, is that those elected officials that knew exactly what they were agreeing to uh, will one day, and hopefully not soon, but it's inevitable, will have blood on their hands. And though it was not a victory to get them to, to overturn that Iran deal, we robbed them of the luxury of being able to say, nobody told us, nobody warned us. And we're going to let that be known. And wrap and starting to approach our wrap up time. And so, the one thing that I want you to be watching for, and, uh, and I think it's more important than ever, you've seen the delegitimization, the demonization, blood libel charges that are being just sweeping across the college campuses in this country in the form of the BDS campaign. Uh, right now, we've just finally unveiled our Washington, D.C. office with a 51C4. And we've, we've already got all eight cylinders firing. We've got Arizona and Idaho teed up. And we're, we are rolling up our sleeves, and we're not going to give up until there is state legislation in all 50 states forbidding BDS in that state. And so, <laughs> I'm not under the illusion you know, that all of you here trust me or like me. And, uh, that wasn't my goal. You know, I, I didn't deliver these things hoping to impress you or to validate that what I do is a notch or two above selling vinyl siding for a living. Uh, we do believe that what we do is fairly relevant and it's making a difference. But it's really late coming. It's long overdue. And it is with a very humble heart and an incredibly heavy sense of spiritual indebtedness to the Jewish community. There were, you know, I say it with tongue in cheek, Jesus wasn't a Christian and Mary wasn't a Catholic and John wasn't a Baptist, they were all Jews. And we forget that. And people say, well, don't you just want to convert us? Isn't that really up your sleeve? Aren't you just, you know, trying to get us to lower our shield? We just, you know, what? I can't even fathom God's mercy. I don't pretend to understand his judgment. And my best answer to that is what you've probably heard before. When the Messiah comes, we'll ask if it's his first or second visit, and one of us will change our theology. <laughs> but until then... We're going to do, we can't, you know, as a Christian, I can't self-loathe what my predecessors did. And I can't rewrite what they did. And if I look in the rearview mirror all the time, I'll run off the road. I can't look back in the past. But I swear to you with every breath and every fiber in my being that there are millions just like me that are committed to change the trend so that history doesn't repeat itself. Dennis Prager pulled me aside and said, there's a question that all Jews ask themselves. Would he hide me? And you've got a lot of people that would. And I, I'm not crying like a little girl. I'm crying like a grown man right now. And I, I, all I hope to do when I came here tonight was to leave you with just a thimble of encouragement that you are not alone and that you've got friends that are not gonna get going when the going gets tough. And so on that note, I want to thank you with the incredible honor that I've been given to be a guest in this house and to just share with what's on my heart and to give you a glimpse of what's very little, very late in coming, but we're doing the best that we can to, uh, with what we've got within our reach. So God bless you and thank you very much for letting me be here.